Hey guys, Corbett Thompson here. At, of course, you can catch us on the King James Radio Network on a regular basis at jamesisking.com. This is our YouTube channel, and this is my Mets rant, where usually there's something to rant about with the New York Mets, and today is no exception. So we'll get right to it. Uh, of course, today is Sunday, June 23rd, where the Mets come off of losing to the Chicago Cubs today as Javi Baez burned the Mets and Seth Lugo for a three-run homer in the eighth inning. And so for those that watch the game, for those Mets fans that watch the game, listen, we could sit here and we could talk about, you know, the fact that Seth Lugo was left in for 42 pitches in the two innings that he pitched or the inning and two-thirds that he pitched. We could talk about the fact that Mickey Calloway still has no clue how to run a bullpen. We could talk about that, and Phil Regan is probably not a whole lot better. But we could talk about the fact that the Cubs tried to give this game to the Mets on a silver platter. Listen, maybe it's just a small body of work here, but I don't see what's you know I don't see there a whole lot to be impressed about with the Cubs. Honestly, I don't think they're that good, and the Mets basically gave this game back to them after the Cubs magnanimously tried to give them the game. Rizzo can't run the bases. Hamels can't hit or can't pitch against right-handed hitters. Okay, he gave up home runs to Nito and Alonzo and almost gave up a shot to Frazier that hit the wall. So, to me, you know, they're not that good. Now, now they, have a, they have a good record when Hamels pitches, but that's basically it. They're well under 500 when he doesn't pitch. And yet... The Mets tried to you know, basically give it back to the Cubs, and they succeeded. So with that being said, you know, this is just another typical. I said on Twitter an hour before it happened, I said on Twitter, this is typically the type of game where the Mets were leading 3-2. to two. This is typically the type of game that the Mets will give back. And I've been a Mets fan for 35 years, so I've seen it. This is typically the kind of game that they give back. And, of course, they held true to form. They did not disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, I, if, when you've been a Mets fan for as long as I have and you've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and the grotesque, you know, you, I don't want to say you expect it, but you're certainly not surprised. And today is no exception. Now, listen, I, for one, have waited to pass judgment on Mickey Calloway as far as whether or not he should be fired. Now, I felt all along that he has no clue how to run a bullpen. That, and today is just more evidence of that. We could talk about Edwin Diaz all we want. Listen, I don't even have a problem with him not bringing in Diaz for four outs, five outs, whatever it is. I don't even have a problem with that. The problem I have is you get Gazelman up, you get Robert Gazelman up, and you don't bring him in. You let Lugo, who is clearly laboring, go ahead and pitch to Baez. Lugo fell behind. He fell behind 3-0 and on three different hitters in the inning and two thirds that he pitched. He fell behind 3-0 and on three different hitters. He got the first two out and walked the third one. But Lugo was falling behind in the count, clearly didn't have his stuff, and Mickey just let him go on and on and on. And then when you get to Baez, and here's the other thing. Obviously, Mickey and Phil Regan, they don't read their scouting reports because SNY showed a graphic right before Baez hit his home run that Baez, his slugging percentage against breaking pitches is well over 600. His slugging percentage against breaking pitches is well over 600. What does Lugo throw him on, a, on what was it, 0-2 count, whatever? What does Lugo throw him? Throws him a breaking ball and hangs it. And Baez took it out to the opposite field. That's not reading your scouting reports. And... That's just another sign that Callaway has no clue and probably Regan right along with him. But I'll give Regan a pass because he just got there. But Callaway certainly has no clue how to manage his bullpen and it apparently doesn't read much of his scouting reports. So, because if the TV people knew that, Callaway should have surely knew it, known it too. But he didn't. And thus, you know, the Mets tank another one. This also falls on Brody Van Wagenen. My biggest question with Brody Van Wagenen has always been from day one since he got the job, does he know how to pick players? 
I've asked that question from day one. Does Brody Van Wagenen know how to pick players? And to this day, from day one until now, the answer is no. It, basically, he might have he might have gotten lucky with getting Echevarria, who, <laughs> ironically enough, now the game plan is they want to probably put Echevarria at shortstop and move Ahmed Rosario to center field, which. When I first heard that, that you're talking about moving Rosario to center field. Now, being that, being that, you know, ever since, ever since I turned Christian and turned my life over to the Lord, I've laid off of swearing. <laughs> so that being said, I look at this and I say, what are you talking about? What are you talking about moving Rosario to center field? He has no instincts at shortstop, I get that. But you're going to put another infielder when you already have a glut of infielders playing in the outfield. you got Don Smith in the outfield. you got J.D. Davis in the outfield. you got Jack McNeil in the outfield. All infielders. And now you want to add another infielder to the outfield by putting Rosario out there. And it's like, what are you doing? It's like they're making it up as they go along. You wait until June to decide, okay, we want to play Rosario in the outfield. It's like that experiment where they tried to put Jose Reyes in the outfield. The, only the Mets can consistently not learn from their mistakes. Only the Mets. And, you know, Joe Beningo, who I listened to for years on the overnights at WFAN, but he has said it all along with the teams that he roots for, you know, Mets, Jets, Knicks Rangers, the players change, the coaches change, the general manager changes, but everything else remains the same. The mediocrity remains the same. It's it's astounding. It is absolutely astounding. Now listen, don't get me wrong, the owners are incompetent, but I don't blame the owners in that as far as, you know, the owners the owners get a big knock for not spending a ton of money. I don't even think it's that. I just think they're just incompetent and they don't know what they're doing either when it comes to baseball. But that being said, they supposedly hired people that do know what they're doing, but they don't either. So <laughs> I think we've come to the point, and like I said, I've held off on getting rid of Mickey Calloway because... I just felt like, okay, we're not even through half a season yet. And they are still, you know, coming into today, they were three and a half games out of the wild card, out of the second wild card. But if the Mets are going to do anything this season, anything whatsoever, because right now you look at it and the answer is no, but if they are going to try to do anything this season, then you're going to have to do something drastic. And when I say drastic, that means letting go of the manager. Now, do I think the Mets will do it? The answer is no. I don't think the Mets will get rid of Callaway this year. I think they're going to stick to their guns and keep Mickey until at least the end of the year. But I think if you want to save this season, it's time to get rid of Mickey because he can't, he can't manage his bullpen and he can barely manage his lineup. You know, pulling, uh, listen, you want to make the excuse that McNeil and Conforto are you know, facing a tough lefty with Cole Hamels? Okay. And then you take Ramos out on top of that. You need to play twice in this series. Which, you know, and there's nothing against Nito, but taking out three of your regulars in an eight-man lineup doesn't exactly give you the best chance to win. Especially, you know, when you got McNeil hitting 340. But when McNeil's hitting 340 in the month of June, he's pretty much proven at that point that he can hit lefties and righties. I understand you want to keep him fresh you know, for the long term, and he's coming off of IL. But you know what? Half the guys in the lineup were on the IL. Robinson Cano was on the IL. Todd Frazier's on the IL. Jed Lowry, he's still there. Probably won't come off of it this year. Half of your guys are on the IL, or were. So, that being said, I understand the frustration of having three guys, you three of your regulars out of the lineup. And when McNeil and Alonzo are the only two guys that are consistently hitting, you know, and that's the other thing that 
aside, you know, Brody Van Wagenen, one of his you know, major flaws, aside from not having a lefty in the bullpen. See, my theory on the bullpen is this with the lefties. With the lefties, you need at least two lefties in the bullpen because you may need to have a lefty for the sixth or seventh inning, and then you may need another lefty for the eighth inning or the ninth inning if it comes to that, depending on what left-handed hitters are coming up. In the case of the Cubs, you've got guys like Rizzo and Jason Hayward. But that being said, I think you need two relievers, two lefties in a bullpen. The Mets have none. None. Zero. How many teams in Major League Baseball, I'd love somebody to find this out for me, but how many teams in Major League Baseball, because I'm not in front of my computer right now, but how many teams in Major League Baseball, when you got the, in the era of where you got eight, nine, ten guys in a bullpen at the expense of your bench, how many guys, how many Major League teams have no lefties in the bullpen? How many teams? It can't be that many, if any at all. It can't be that many. So that's another flaw of Brody Van Wagen and this flawed plan that they have. So, you know, you, you could at least bring in a lefty to pitch to a power hitting lefty. That type of thing. So it's just jacked up. It really is. And do I see it getting any better? No, the Mets aren't getting back over 500. They're not. They got the Phillies coming up, got the Yankees coming up, but they're not getting back over 500. This season, you know, is pretty much shot. Um, they may win two games in a row. They may win three games in a row at, at certain points in the season. But as long as Mickey continues to, to bungle the bullpen, and as long as you don't have a lefty in said bullpen, and as long as only McNeil and Alonzo seem to want to play, you know, now Frazier's giving you spurts. And Dom Smith, you know, the issue with Dom Smith is, you know, he's not going to get consistent playing time. Because obviously you have Alonzo at first base, and then you've got, you're going to play McNeil in left field, you're going to play J.D. Davis in left field, so that doesn't leave a lot of time for Dom Smith, even though he, out of the three, is their best hitter. So you figure that out. But right now, Mickey barely knows what he's doing with the lineup. Barely. If it wasn't for the offense on this team, who knows where they'd be? And again, in particular, McNeil and, you know, Jeff McNeil and Pete Alonzo. And congrats to Pete Alonso on breaking the Mets uh, home run rookie home, you know, home run rookie record. You know, he passed Dal Strawberry. Dal Strawberry was the guy that I followed growing up. You know, and you know those teams in the mid '80s. You know, the Black Ted Williams and all of that. Um, and Straw congratulated Pete Alonso in a written in a written statement. But you know, come mid July. With the trading deadline approaching, there's not going to be a whole lot to talk about here. You know, so because Brody doesn't seem capable of landing a big player here. You know, the Yankees go out and get Edwin Encarnacion. He only leads the American League in home runs. But like I said, Brody, you know, seems his hands seem to be tied mysteriously. Maybe we can have Sherlock Holmes come in and investigate. But that being said, uh, I don't know what else to tell you. You know, like I said, if the Mets are going to try to salvage any type of playoff run this season, it's probably time to let the manager go. That doesn't mean have Jim Riggleman come in, but it means it's time to let the manager go. I've said this before. Joe Girardi's not coming here. You're not getting Joe Girardi or any big-time manager to come here and deal with this mess. It's not happening. So first, Brody's got to fix some things, and then – you got to see about getting a decent manager. So with that being said, I don't think either of those things are going to happen. Not this year, maybe in the off season, maybe Brody smartens up in the off season, maybe, but as far as the rest of this year, I don't, I don't see it happening. You, there's no indication to think, I mean, Brooks Pounders might be the best you're going to get this year. And don't get me wrong. Pounders has pitched well. All right. He allowed the one inherited run, but other than that, he's pitched well in the short time he's been there. But that being said, uh, you know, well, what are you going to do? Anyway, that's my Mets rant for this week. So, you know, here from the dog park here where, you know, my dog is walking around, you know, free as can be. Um, <laughs> but she's happier than us Met fans right now. So with that being said, I wish you guys well. Goodbye. Godspeed. And we'll talk to you again soon. 
for what I'm sure will be another Mets rant. All right, bye-bye.